In our gospel lesson today, Jesus is headed directly to the cross. He is facing Jerusalem and there is no turning back. He knows the violence that lies ahead of him, the violence that humanity will bring upon him. And so in the reading, as Jesus and his disciples are walking toward Jerusalem, they visit town after town. Today, they find themselves in Samaria. And now you need to know as background to understand this story that the Jews and the Samaritans, well, they are pretty much sworn enemies. Ever since the Jews returned from Babylonian exile about 500 years before Jesus was born, there had been tension between the Samaritans and the Jews. And well, as we can tell from our story today, the tensions really hadn't let up. As the disciples come into the Samaritan village, they discover that the people there aren't willing to accept Jesus as the Savior. In, in their minds, Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount, and in their minds, the Jews have forgotten where the real mountain of God is, Samaria. It's because of this. They reject him as the Savior. Now, this doesn't go over so well for some of the disciples, though, especially James and John, who can't let it go, and ask Jesus if he wants them to pray for their destruction, if Jesus wants them to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them. Instead of just letting them be, instead of just shaking the dust off their feet like Jesus clearly told them to do earlier in this chapter. The disciples here want to use their shared power for destructive purposes. They have this crazy notion that if they're not like us, or if they don't want to become like us, you know, the only right ones in the world, well, then they aren't worth anything. Even that they ought to suffer for not being like them. In short, some of the disciples, you know, the ones who get it wrong here, want the others to be rebuked. They want them to be punished. But what is so ironic and hopefully a little humoristic for us is that it's these disciples who Jesus rebukes in the story. Jesus turns the tables on them. The disciples can't see the folly of their own ways because they are concentrated so much on what other people ought to be doing. It's a whole log in your own eye thing we see happening here. It's the disciples who aren't learning to listen well to Jesus. It's the disciples who aren't taking Jesus at his word and doing as he tells us to do. In this gospel story, it's not the others who need to change their ways, it's us. It's the disciples. I find it sadly ironic how Christians have done such a poor job of following Jesus' ways of nonviolence, of how much violence has been per perpetrated in the name of Jesus Christ. Especially when Jesus is as clear today in our reading as he is for a desire for peace. It's truly sad how for generation after generation, many of Jesus' followers have never listened to him, but instead used our fleshy ways of violence to try and force the world to be what we want, like we even did to Jesus as we nailed him to the cross. Historically, the church has often had close and even direct ties to violence and war. Yes, we've tried to justify it with the inquisitions and invasions, claiming that the salvation of souls is more valuable than the salvation of bodies. And yes, even our own Martin Luther in the Peasants' Revolt, justifying violence as the only means to combat violence, calling for the nobles to put down the rebels like mad dogs. For some evil and disgusting reason, it seems that we just can't stop ourselves. We always try and justify the violence, just like the disciples did in our reading today. Just like when Peter or 
Maybe another disciple, as noted in the Gospel of Matthew, tried to justify violence by trying to save Jesus with the sword, cutting off the ear of the one arresting Jesus. It seems that there's always a human justification we can come up with to perpetuate the cycle of violence, but, and this is a huge but, our justification, so too, is always, always rebuked by God. When we want a destruction of enemies, God tells us to love them. And Jesus makes it very clear today that there are to be no exceptions. The disciples want violence. The ones who walked with Jesus and many others up to the present day, generation after generation, we see it as a necessary evil. And so sadly, join forces with that evil, happy to take its side, pretending like Jesus just doesn't know what he's saying. But maybe, maybe one day we will finally listen. Listen to the better way that Jesus teaches us to live as he does again in the gospel today. But despite this, we still often want to see violence in this world as a form of correction. Jesus' disciples want to see the others rebuked. They want to watch others learn their lesson for not following Jesus' teachings. The ironic thing being that we are the ones who in the gospel get to that rebuking ourselves. The disciples want others to be rebuked, but here learn that it is us who are going to get it. We are not of one mind with Jesus Christ yet. It is so hard for us to give up our old ways and actually have faith that Jesus' nonviolence, his self-sacrificing ways of life, really are the best ways for us to live life too. Jesus is unwavering in his commitment to his mission in Jerusalem, and he will not be swayed by the pettiness of the disciples. In a series of striking cases in point, he calls the disciples, that means us, to a single-mindedness with him. Like Jesus' teaching, we need to accept that when we harm others, intentionally or not, we are inevitably harming ourselves, becoming less than what we were created to be. Violence against one is violence against all, and the violence as we see in the gospel, doesn't stop with us. It even leads to us taking up violence against God. We crucified him once. We aren't willing to do it again, are we? The message Jesus has for his disciples is one for the apostles, for us, and for every, genera every generation in between and after. Jesus corrects the disciples, wanting us to be of one mind with him, of one mind in a way of nonviolence and heavenly peace on earth. As children of God, Jesus' way of nonviolence is to become our way. He has shown us our Father's way, and it's time, it's our time to grow up and step into those shoes. May we remember well that in this story, in Jesus' mind, it's not the non-Christians who need to change. It's the Christians, those closest to him that he rebukes, not those that the disciples think deserve it. It's us in this story who have a log in our eye. Not them, not others, but us. And while we may not want to hear that, while we may not want to be rebuked, Jesus isn't going to give up until we join him in his mission in the world, a mission of peace and love for all, especially those who we don't want it to be for, our sworn enemies, especially those that we'd enjoy watching fire come down from heaven and consume.
So the question we are left to ask ourselves today, are we going to follow Jesus? Listening to his rebuke of us and change our violent ways? Or are we going to be like the original disciples who don't? Who keep silent at the violence and contribute to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, to the most ultimate historical moment of violence on the face of this earth? Are we going to be part of the answer? The solution to ending the cycle of violence begun with Cain and Abel? Or like the disciples in the story, are we still going to be part of the problem? It's a log in our own eyes kind of problem we're dealing with today for the disciples back then and for us here too. You know, I think we too often, I know I'm guilty of this too, turn the Bible, turn to the Bible to justify what we already think. But the gospel points out to us today that this is not how it's supposed to work. The gospel, like Jesus Christ, the word himself, is meant to challenge us and help us see the folly in our own ways. It's about a journey of self-discovery of who we were made to be. It points us to God's ways. And yeah, it might not be fun to be rebuked called out to our faces for our violence against each other and against God. But when Jesus does it, are we willing to respond faithfully? Are we willing to stop justifying violence in the name of our God, who is clearly a God of nonviolence? God willing, may this generation finally be the one who takes Jesus at his word and bends its swords into plowshares. May this generation learn from the mistakes of the past and set down our ways of violence that continue to hang Jesus on that cross over and over again, day after day. May we remember that our ways of violence are no different than the violence that was used to hammer the nails through the hands of Jesus Christ into that cross. It's no different. They justified it too. Amen.